Uh, Dakota Lakes Research Farm. You know, one of the things as I go through today, I think I, I really want you guys to think about where you want to be in 100 years because you've got to get in gear and get the agricultural research system working to get you there. If we, if we had the system we have now, if we'd have had that 30 years ago, we would not have Dakota Lakes. And you wouldn't know any of this stuff. Okay, so <clears throat> you really need to start paying attention to what's happening at all the land grant universities in the United States because they're just totally being taken over and, and it really isn't applied research, a lot of it. So there's the Dakota Lakes Research Farm. It's owned by farmers, both irrigated and dry land. We've been 100% low disturbance snow till. Um, production enterprise profit supports research and that's why we've been able to continue. If you're not a member of Dakota Lakes, you should be. If you haven't visited Dakota Lakes, you should. I have people from all over the world come to visit us there, and I have a lot of people in South Dakota who've never been there, which is kind of interesting. Uh, <clears throat> and we're building a, an addition on our shop, so if you want to really get involved, you could make a donation to that. So there's our native vegetation. This is one of the most exciting days I've had <clears throat> my time at Dakota Lakes. This is a, not quite a year ago, January last year. This is Colin Sice. He's from Australia, he's a grain and graze guy I've talked about. It's kind of a perennial cover cropping system in Australia that works really well. This is Rolf Derps. I think a couple people mentioned Rolf. Uh, he's from Paraguay. And this is Dursu Gosan. We call him Duracell because he always goes. He's from Brazil as well. And they came through. Now these guys, you notice Brazil, Paraguay, and Australia is about 23 below that day. And they wanted to take a picture by the sign because they'd come to the Dakota Lakes Research Farm, so they wanted this sign. So we're standing out there, we found all the coats we could. And then we went out and showed them some of what we did. This is irrigated corn on corn. We're planting between the corn rows. Uh, we'll do a two year stack. And then, and then this past year, we planted canola right in this little spot here. Uh, and we dug around. Uh, Dersu is much more excited than Rolf. And, and you notice Colin isn't even there. He's in the damn truck. He's had enough of this. Okay, so a little bit of biodiversity growing there. Um, anyway, 1979, I've shown you this before, the average wheat price in, 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 in 1970 is $1.37. The average price of barrel oil is $3.39. <laughs> so you just do the math for today. It's about 89 bucks for a barrel of oil today, uh, but nine bucks for wheat. Minnesota, where tillage is king, it takes slightly under 10 gallons of diesel fuel per acre for tillage, seeding, and harvest. So that's not a lot. Four bucks a gallon, that's 40 bucks. It's not a big input if you're looking at price of land in Minnesota for, for whatever. So uh, <clears throat> to take, no-till is not about taking out the energy cost. It takes the energy of one gallon of diesel fuel to manufacture, transport, and to pipe five pounds of nitrogen. So that Minnesota farmer puts on 150 pounds of acre, uh, per acre of N, the energy is three times, 30 gallons, that he used for tillage, seeding, and harvest. So the big energy input is nitrogen fertilizer. The big problem with doing tillage is it screws up all the things these guys talked about. I had one guy come up and said, boy, you're, I'm a conventional tiller, you're really making us conventional tillers feel bad and whatever. And I said, well, you better go home before three. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> 80% of the total input costs in agriculture can be traced directly to energy. We all feel really good about how, we, how good of farmers we are. 80% of that's due to energy. 120 years ago, that was zero. 120 years from now, it has to be zero again because we're going to be out of fossil fuels. <laughs> now, some people say I'm going to use biodiesel. If we took, and we are cold pressing our oil seeds and stuff, right? At the farm, because we're going to be fossil fuel neutral by 2026. 
But if I took all the oils and fats in the United States, beef tallow, pork lard, all the corn oil, soybean oil, and whatever, and made them into B100, we would have about 20% of our road diesel plus home heating needs. And that's it. We'd have nothing for agriculture, nothing for electrical generation, nothing for industrial. <coughs> and we still need 80%. It's not the answer. Okay? It's a way for us to have diesel fuel in case we can't get it to run our combines, but it's not a long-term solution. So, <clears throat> I'm a farmer. I take sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide and make them into products I can sell. You notice I didn't say anything about energy and iron and whatever. How well do we do this? One of the things we do is we get hung up on these terms. Randy England was over here running all these terms by me. and I had this put together already, Randy, and I just sat there and smiled at you, right? <clears throat> Sustainable, no-till, regenerative, organic, zero-tills, direct seed. What the hell you want to call yours, right? I don't know. Yeah, I got another name, right? The new one is soil health. Okay, but you have a hell of a time defining that, too. We had NRCS had a whole soil health team, right? Remember all the boys out in Colorado? They showed up one day, and they're trying to write a definition. This is what you do, got to do to have a healthy soil. You got to, and you do... And I took them out of one of my fields and I dug up a little soil. And I said, smell this. And they smelled it and they said, now, you know, if you get something to measure that smell, that would work. But I also challenged them. I said, define a beautiful woman or a handsome man. How tall, how, what size hair, what color hair, what size different things, right? You can't write a definition for, but we all know one when we see one, okay? <clears throat> mine, mine happens to be at 20, our 25th wedding anniversary about two weeks ago. Ooh. <laughs> she needs a sympathy card, not, a, not an <laughs> One, I get a really kick out of it. I was traveling to Canada last year. They came up with this term, ethical oil. It means that the oil from Canada, even though they, they dig it out of the tar sands and heat the ever loving hell out of it and do all this stuff, at least their women are well treated and they get educations and whatever, whereas in some of the, Saudi, the, the Eastern, Middle Eastern nations, they aren't treated as well, right? And they have human rights and whatever. So their oil is better, it's ethical oil. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> that works. Okay, we spend lots of time trying to find what we should do and should not do and little time focusing on where we want to be. Where do you want to be? Consequently, much of the research and management effort is devoted to optimizing a single component like canola or corn. You know, how can you better manage? What, how can you kill that? What event do you have in that corn? And when you're resistant to that corn, you've got to get another event, right? Spend all this time looking at these little tiny details. <clears throat> and we're using more and more specialized treatment. We're really focusing on the end instead of acting to get where we want to be. We're reacting. Reacting from going where we do not want to be instead of focusing on where we want to be. It's a little bit like trying to drive your car down the highway by looking at the edge of the ditch. Okay, that works in a blizzard for you boys from the south that don't really understand how to drive in a blizzard, right? <laughs> See, all these South Dakota guys know how to do this. <laughs> When you're drunk driving in a blizzard in the old days, it's really fun. But it's not ideal way to get home. <clears throat> now, there's no better time than now. We've never been more profitable. You know, I can tell by all the four-wheel drive pickups around, people have some spare cash, right? So where do we want to be? Where do you want South Dakota to be in 200 years? What do you want it to look like? If we keep doing what we're doing, what's it going to look like? Okay? 
So what 30 years of no-till and crop rotation work have taught me, remember that I'm a slow learner. If you don't believe that, ask my wife. I have learned more from farmers than they have learned from me, and I've learned more from farmers because they call me up and say, how would you do this? Or I did this and this happened. And to my advantage is I've talked to a lot of farmers that have made a lot of mistakes, and we all learn. And I've also had 30 years to make mistakes on my own. I've learned more from observing nature than trying to change it. And I gave a talk last spring at SDSU to a bunch of really young faculty members that don't know South Dakota about where Dakota Lakes came from. And I started with the La Andre brothers. How many people here know who the La Andre brothers are? Yeah, people from around here do. Okay, they are the French fur traders' sons from Winnipeg that came across the Continental Divide from the Red River Valley to the, the Missouri River Valley looking for a westward passage and also to claim this area for France. And the reason we bought it in the Louisiana Purchase from France were those guys. But they're also looking for beavers. And then Lewis and Clark were looking for beavers to kill. And once we killed the beavers, we no longer had the beaver dams that kept the water from flooding the Missouri River. And a white man wasn't smart enough to build his houses up on the hills. They built them in the river bottoms. And we start flooding, so then we had to build big-ass dams. And when we built the dams, we had to take water from Pier to Redfield to irrigate because you couldn't possibly grow corn and soybeans in the Jim River Valley without irrigation. Duh. Right? I've learned more from observing nature than trying to change it. I thought, hell, we can do this. We can grow corn and soybeans in the Jim River Valley if we no-till. We can grow corn at Pier if we no-till. If we better use the water, because Mother Nature could do just fine doing that. No-till is just one tool among many that we use to help us manage our ecosystem. But if we do tillage, we've got everything so screwed up we can't manage it anymore. So the first step had to be quit doing tillage. And then you do adjust all these other things. And you guys have seen this before. But a lot of guys just quit doing tillage, didn't change anything else. Oh, we're just going to do corn beans like we always did. And it collapses. Okay? So cultural practices, technology, and management. We have to, tillage is a cultural practice. We have to replace it with other cultural practices, not with technology. Technology is fine. But if you try to replace what you did with tillage with only technology, there's not enough technology available. If it were available, we couldn't afford it. You know, it's not available because we get resistant. If it were available, we couldn't afford it. And if it, even if it were available and we could afford it, you got to sell it to the consumer. And they, frankly, don't want us doing that. Nature tillage is a catastrophic event. So when we take it out, let's do this rotation sanitation comp competition. Proper intensity, using this water. And cover crops is part of that. Adequate diversity. Mother Nature tends to produce lots of diversity when given her way. And we try to crunch this down to do one or two species, and she's trying to have all this diversity. We're just going against what she's trying to do. And trust me, she's had several million years of doing this. And no matter what them gene jockeys at SDSU think, she's better at it than they are. Okay? And so they can keep doing it. That's fine. But she's just going to say, oh, I see what you're up to. Here, try that. And if we can get this part right, then we're going to be stable and sustainable. The other way to look at it is water cycle. Are we cycling the water the way it was cycled before we start farming? If not, we're leaking stuff. And we're leaking nutrients out. And they're going, like Ray said, to the Gulf of Mexico or wherever. OK? 
Okay, if we put drain tile in, we really screw these up. Energy flow, how much of the energy that's falling there are we catching? I'm going to Manitoba tonight. They used to do summer fallow. Last week I was in Montana with, with Paul, and they still do summer fallow. What percentage, if they're doing spring wheat summer fallow, what percentage of the sunlight that falls on the ground in two years do they catch? Well, everything from May, June, and July, one year out of two, three months out of 24. Not very good. And community dynamics, what happens with how many species do you have there? Farmers and ranchers harvest sunlight, carbon dioxide and water, right? Some of this is human food. We need to be aware of nutritional issues and off-site impacts. When you raise food in different ways, wheat for instance, it has different qualities. People are starting to become interested in that. Dakota Lakes right now is having long discussions with the people who buy, buy grain and things for Kellogg and Kashi and Starbucks and whatever based on this factor. And they initiated it, not us. If we want to eat beef, that's great. Maybe we should concentrate on producing beef instead of trying to grow corn and barley that feeds beef and feedlots. You know, just, if we all want to grow some beef out here, let's figure out how to grow the best way to do that. Weeds and diseases are Mother Nature's way of adding diversity to a system that lacks it. So the more you try to concentrate on one species, the more she's going to try to offer alternatives. Nothing new. You've seen these before for me. Savings might be expected in the amount of fertilizer and irrigation water used in a three-year rotation. He's talking about wheat because of healthier, more functional root systems. That could be corn. When you have a drought year like this year, was your plant root healthy? Was it <clears throat> in a healthy soil that had all these macropores so it could explore the whole root zone? Because that's part of what has to happen. Biological control of soil and residue inhabiting pests of wheat is accomplished by not growing wheat more frequently than every third year, second or third year. A change in cultural practices not pay, may not pay off the first one or two years. Ray was talking about that. might take a while. So did Paul. But will pay off in time. Each future wheat field or corn field is treated to the extent possible as an ecosystem to be nudged rather than shocked in the desired direction. Right now everybody's trying to shock the thing and we'll throw this fungicide on, but that kills his beneficials. And if you put fungicide on there, fun fungus is what the earthworms eat. Bad ones and good ones, so you're going to starve them to death. We haven't used an insecticide at Dakota Lake in 12 years. Not because I'm saying, gee, we don't want to use insecticide, because we don't have to. We have predators. We use some seed treatments and things, but we don't use the high-rate cruisers and stuff either. It kills our predators. The surest way... For me to guarantee that I'd have to use a post-emergent insecticide is to put some insecticide with my herbicide just because it only costs a buck. Okay. Crop rotation is the single most critical factor affecting the health and productivity of future crops in general. Crop rotation allows time for natural enemies to destroy the pathogens of one crop while unrelated crops are growing. This is not hard. Choose a sustainable economic approach that optimizes productivity while taking maximum advantage or at least not getting in the road of Mother Nature's contribution to the health of a crop. Over-reliance on herbicides leads to resistant weeds and maybe disease problems. Is there anybody in this room that was in Denver in 1994 at Monsanto's big conference out there? I did the close. 1994, I did the closing talk at a Monsanto conference in Denver, 2,000 people, and I predicted Roundup resistance. I have the tape. Not a popular position to take at a Monsanto conference in 1994. <laughs> <clears throat> it's simple. You had to know that was going to happen. 
unless you were just totally brain dead. Monsanto knew. They were just hoping that their patent ran out before it happened. And it's not their problem, it's your problem. It's because we misuse it, right? And maybe disease problems, if we use surfactants too frequently, may increase disease issue. Have we seen an increase in bacterial blight in Goss's will? Those used to be associated with hail and wind and things, which weaken the lack, wax on the leaves. But if we go out and spray fung, uh, surfactants with fungicides, surfactants with herbicides, surfactants with whatever, we weaken the wax on the leaves. Makes it easier for the bacteria to get in there. It also kills beneficial bacteria that attack fungi. In Saskatchewan, they found that if they spray fungicides early on wheat, they increase the amount of fusarium because they kill a beneficial fungi early. Go to the web, it's there. It's been published, real science. Fungicides and insecticides cause collateral damage. They are disturbance, just like anything else. So we're going to use them, but we're going to try to use them judiciously. So we look at some other things like chloride soil testing can be used to minimize the need for early season fungicide. If you have a chloride deficiency, it makes you susceptible to leaf spotting diseases. <clears throat> Rotation interval in weeds. If we want to <clears throat> prevent weeds, this is, uh, if you have a resistant weed, 10 of them here with 10 seeds per, per weed, and you do a rotation that's every other year, like corn bean, you have 10 million of them in seven years. <clears throat> and that's assuming that you kill it during the bean year. So Roundup resistance just doesn't count. That's more like a whatever. If I go two years out, it never happens. If I'm going to do half corn, half beans, I'd be better off to do a stack where I do two corns, two beans. Okay. Here's a study that we did years ago. <clears throat> where we did 12 years of different rotation. On the 13th year, I just planted the whole thing to spring wheat. And Randy Anderson from ARS came out and he counted the weeds that came up. Okay, so we, he counted the weeds, we sprayed, sprayed Roundup, and then we planted our spring wheat, and then we just didn't put any more herbicide on, and he counted the weeds. Where we had wheat chickpea, and this could be corn and soybean if you want to. He had 94 weeds per square Yard, wheat, corn, chickpea, 40, pea, wheat, corn, soybean, more diversity, 7. <clears throat> now, high disturbance techniques increase wet pressure and cause tillage erosion. This is 97% weed control, by the way, with no herbicide, <laughs> in, case you're, in case you're wondering. Uh, high disturbance techniques increase weed pressure and cause tillage erosion. He did the same count in a tilled site with a two crop rotation. There's 225 versus 94, four crop rotation, seven versus 44. This is due to the tillage causing more weeds. Somebody talked about that earlier today. Was it you, Rick? Yeah. God, he's good, isn't he? <laughs> Worth all the money we spent getting him here. No, you're not. We're all taxpayers. We all, we all paid for you to come here. I knew you were going to say that. You, you may be cheap, but you're not free, right? <laughs> Till age of servants and poor rotation, 225 weeds per square meter, no-till good rotation, seven. There's your 97% weed control. Tillage was good at eliminate weeds. The damn thing should be all gone by now especially in Iowa and Illinois, right? <laughs> Best weed control is a good crop canopy. We keep this old crop canopy in place or a cover crop canopy or anything like that in place until a new crop canopy forms. And that's one of the things with a cover crop. You just go out there and put another crop canopy there instead of trying to kill it with an herbicide. This is when we had an auto steer. We have an auto steer now. But this is when we had an ought to. Ought to steer better. And, 
and you, you, you don't pull in straight, but this is no herbicide on wheat with a, with a spot there that's left and no competition. That's what you want to be able to see. But there's tillage erosion. We took the dirt from here, pulled it down here. Started out looking like this, then it, <clears throat> medium term, it got this bare, that's about where we're at. If we keep doing that, we're going to take the crappy soil and cover up the good soil down on the bottom. And we're all going to use variable rate technology so we fertilize the top of the hill and drag the shit down the bottom down here. Now, in Canada, they do bale grazing. They put their bales up here and turn the cows out, and the cows poop and eat and whatever, and you restore fertility and organic matter back to the top of the hill. It makes a lot of sense. They put, put a fence around the bales. Really a kind of a good system. Sanitation, rotation, and competition are the primary methods of pest control. Herbicides are part of competition. They're part of sanitation. They're part of rotation. They're, I don't use herbicides for pest control. I use them as tools in this other little goal. Pesticides are only part of these. Fertilizer placement and residue distribution are part of competition. I'm going to place some fertilizer, maybe move a little residue, we're much less gung-ho about moving residue than before, but if I put my crop here and I put <coughs> fertilizer there and nothing out here, then my weeds don't have a chance. So again, I can get this guy going before these guys have any nice warm conditions and before they get any fertilizer. This guy's got to learn to drive on the other side of the field so this blows away. And if you get a 45-foot <coughs> head, from somebody like John Deere and say, <clears throat> you know, if you make a head 45 foot wide, you should make a thing in the back that spreads it out 45 feet, right? Should be a requirement. We use a lot of stripper head for that reason. But John Deere hadn't figured that out, neither did anybody else. <clears throat> Place a fertilizer, you know, strip tail's hot, but basically it's a fertilizer placement thing. And here's that bar that somebody was talking about today. This is the cheap bar. Just, now some guys want corn heads that chop it all up and whatever, but then it blows away and floats away. You leave it tall and you use this thing to lean it over, put a little fertilizer there and plant. This is Mike Arnold's planter from whatever. So what we do is some start to pee with a seed, other nutrients placed near the row at seeding time or on the soil surface after crop canopy. If you broadcast fertilizer before or at seeding, it encourages weeds. Three key factors, available nutrient, moisture and roots, all three in the same place at the same time. And Ray Ward will tell you how much available nutrient you have there or estimate it, give you his best guess. How many of you guys know Ray Ward? Yeah, okay. Do you know that he got his PhD from SDSU? He used to run the soil testing lab. His major professor and his PhD was the same guy as my major professor. He ran the Redfield farm at one time. We're like twins, okay? Maybe not. <laughs> He's a hell of a lot better looking than I am. Okay, <clears throat> we don't kill our coyotes. You can't figure out why everybody wants to kill their damn coyotes. They eat, they eat mice. We don't kill our rattlesnakes, right? And one of the reasons we don't kill our rattlesnakes is somebody who does organic comes. And they say, well, you're using these terrible chemicals. And they say, well, what's, what do you use? We only use natural stuff. It's not dangerous. It's good. I got a rattlesnake you need to move because he's not going to hurt you, obviously. Because <laughs> it's natural. <laughs> ah, proper nutrient cycling is important. Ecosystems that leak nutrients for extended periods of time become deserts. If you ship your wheat out and don't bring back the nutrients in terms of fertilizer, you have a desert. You're exporting. You're leaking. We had a Taiwanese, Randy was there, right? We had this Taiwanese trade delegation. One of the things about being close to peer, right? We're just handy for these trade delegations. They got to meet with the governor and they got to stall them for an hour and a half. So let's go see some wheat. We're going to sell you wheat. So I'm. <coughs> Talking to them, and I got this wheat coming up, and the cover crop is dying, and I'm talking about how it's feeding the nutrients to the wheat and everything, and the guy goes, oh, 
you don't need to use fertilizer. And they said, well, yeah, I do need to fertilize, use fertilizer if I'm going to ship you the wheat to Taipei because I'm shipping you nutrients unless you're willing to take the poop from Taipei, put it in a container, and ship it back. <laughs> and he got this real stunned look on his face. And I thought, okay, I started a diplomatic problem here. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he gets it and he starts laughing and he translates and then they're all making a little scoopy. <laughs> Saline seeps are symptoms of improper nutrient water cycling. If it wasn't salty when it was in the prairie, it's, you'd done something. Nutrient placement is part of cycling. Try to make it go into the plant. <clears throat> Developing proper water cycling information is important. You need to know soil's water holding capacity characteristics, long-term rainfall, and cover and forage crops are useful to help fine tune. So here's my north unit, pure shale derived promise soil and opal soils, uh, pretty crappy. Don't hold much water. Went to web soil survey, which you have in the United States. How many people have been to web soil survey? Good. Good on you. Go home, go to Web Soil Survey, get a map. This is <coughs> Corco's Buck and Horse Pasture. If you're watching the national finals, you see my neighbors. You know, because Corco takes my neighbors, takes them to Las Vegas, and I don't get to go. And this shows you how much available water holding capacity. This is three inches, this is five inches. Total water holding capacity in that really heavy soil. It's like a sand with a really bad attitude. There I use cover crops a lot because it gets full very quickly. And I'm going to talk about a lot of what we do there. There's the main farm. There's my good soil. That's about 12 inches available water holding capacity. Okay? Those are my good soils. Then we take some place like Oneida, which is kind of dry. There's your rainfall from October to September. I use October 1 to September. <clears throat> Take the E out of ET. Yeah, Paul, I know you can't get it all out of there, but it sounds better. You know, taking, take part of the E out of ET. You can't take it all out. That means you I take the E out of ET. <clears throat> so, from October to June, from the time you would harvest corn until sunflowers would start using water, Oneida, way the hell out there, gets 10.36 inches of rainfall. If you make it go in the ground and you keep it there and you have a promised soil, you're saturated, and you're getting saline seeps, and you're screwed. Now, if you have a good soil, you, if you were way dry when you harvested the corn, which you usually aren't, <coughs> you're going to be way full. Okay? So you can do that kind of exercise. Half of normal is usually a drought. This year is a little bit more than, a little less than half of normal. And then this is one and a half, that wet year. Okay? And you can do that for different time periods. Right? The long fallow, the wheat long fallow, they used to do it in Ida. One crop of winter wheat every two years. They tried to put 24 inches of rain into soils that hold somewhere between 7 to 12. Is there any wonder they had saline seeps? Duh. No-till does make saline seeps worse because it makes the water go in the ground unless you do something beneficial with that water. Why does land sell for more in Iowa than it does in South Dakota? They get more rain. But yet we have guys here trying to get rid of their water. So, if you put this rain in here with no-till, you got to use it here or it becomes a saline seep here. And what's in a saline seep? Ray. Calcium salts. What else is in there? Sulfur. Is that a fertilizer? Yeah. And calcium's a like lime. Yeah. What's the other one that's in there? Chloride. Chloride. Oh, we use that for fertilizer? Yeah. Nitrate. Nitrate. Do we use that for fertilizer? Yeah. Who said salt? <laughs> but it's these really good salts. Sometimes you get a little sodium. But most of the time. What's in there is the good guys, your fertilizers that you're paying the hefties for. And what they really want to do is get you a drain tile so you can get that damn stuff gone quicker so they can sell you more. <laughs> 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 
Duh. Cover and forage crops provide opportunity to increase both intensity and diversity in situations where production or grain crop would not be possible. So where you can't do a double crop like the guys in Kansas, you start doing some of this stuff and add biological diversity. In humid environments, tall grass, prairie, or wetter, which is kind of here and eats, <clears throat> the goal should be have something growing at all times. Where we have limited growing season, this will require use of cover crops and forage crops or double crops. So that's here. You don't have a long enough season like the guys in Kansas. In subhuman to the west of here, semi-arid and arid environments, cover crops are utilized less, actually, but it gives us a chance to add organic matter and biological activity. Sometimes we have to keep our powder dry. Uh, <clears throat> so here, we're adding carbon. This is going to go to beans next year versus not doing anything. So here's stripped wheat stubble. Here's adding hay millet and oats in there. And then here we have <coughs> some feed that we can graze for our tall cows and our short cows. Uh, <laughs> I like that joke. Uh, now here's a real mixture of stuff. And that's what we look for is this diversity. They grow at different times. We'll start with like cow peas and the brassicas and the lentils. And the cow peas will grow early when it's hot, and then when it gets to be first night, it's 36 degrees, they go, oh, damn, this isn't Oklahoma. And they just die. And then you got the next step. Same way as the forage sorghum. So I use oats and forage sorghum and the, and the, and the hay millets. And when they get, it gets too cool for them, they die, and the oats come. So that's what we're looking for is filling these different niches. So there's, <coughs> there's a cow pea that comes early. This stuff back here, I actually got this in the wrong order. This comes later, okay? <clears throat> Does it work, kind of? Here's a study we did where we had a, a cover crop of lentils, chick uh, chickling vetch, and turnip between a wheat, so wheat, wheat, corn, corn, soybean, soybean, so right in here between the wheat and the first corn. We put no nitrogen on the next spring. We got 176 bushel of corn with 36 pounds of nitrogen. We got 236 bushel of corn with 72 pounds. We got 214. Now, sometimes it, you get, you know, and what we got to do is start figuring out how to predict that's going to happen. But the good thing in South Dakota is if I want to use this nitrogen, I can soil test and I'll have it again next year. Just get it in the pool. It doesn't hurt to have it there. So this is what I call catch and release nutrients. And a lot of people use this, and we should give the credit for that to Jeremy Wilson from Jamestown, North Dakota. Really good, young, no-till farmer from Jamestown, North Dakota. And he used this term, and I walked up after he used it at a meeting. I said, Jeremy, can I use that? Oh, well, sure. He didn't know that everybody else is going to start using it, right? So anyway, we need to acknowledge that. If you get stranded in the rain in the back 40, you drive home across a child, a tilled field or a pasture. That's that soil structure thing that Jim Horman talked about. Okay, it doesn't get there if you do tillage every other year or whatever. Okay, if at least some components of a rotation do not fail in excessively dry years, it's an indicator there's not sufficient intensity. So if you failed on something this year, you did good. Okay. Some of us did better than others. The rotation does not. <coughs> but I'll give you an example. We, at, we do a third of our dry land corn at pier in soybean or sunflower residue. A third. Because I call it my mother-in-law corn or my banker corn. Because they come to visit in June. That's my corn that looks good. And then two-thirds of my corn is in wheat stubble, and if my banker comes in September or August, I should show him the stuff in wheat stubble, right? But in a good year, that's my cheapest corn in soybean stubble. I don't have to maintain the wheat stubble, right? I just harvest the beans the first thing in the spring, I plant the corn. That's it. Pretty easy to manage. Last year, I had 140 bushel corn there. This year, I had zero. On average, we're about 110. Okay, that's okay. It's not as consistent as the stuff in wheat stubble. 
but if I don't fail in the really dry year, I haven't taken full advantage of this normal year when I get 108 bushel. And I fail badly in wet years, and that's what a lot of us did early on. We're so afraid of being too damn dry that we get too conservative in terms of pushing the rotation, and we fail because it's too wet. If you're failing, cons what you want to do is fail parts of the rotation when it's too wet, fail in parts of the rotation when it's too dry, and most years still all work pretty good. We, all, we also harvest 100 bushel wheat, so uh, 99 eight or something like that average on the main farm. So we had a good year from that standpoint. Crop insurance regulations impact risks associated with different rotational intensities and also make sure that your crop insurance rules fit what you're doing with cover crops. So we got a guy in Kansas who basically lost his whole payment because he did a bunch of stuff with cover crops. And they came out and said, that's not approved. <clears throat> there should be no need for a ground engaging component to seed and fertilize crops. We should be able to shoot them in the ground with something like this. So all this talk about trying to cut residue and do all that kind of stuff, if we could just have a seed in a thing that looks like a golf tee and just shoot it in the ground, it'd be great. Go out there with our floater and put it on. <clears throat> Ray talked about one straw revolution using clay seed balls, same idea. Seed stakes would do the same thing. And basically what he's doing is he spreads his seed balls out, drains the, the rice fields, spreads the seed balls out for his wheat crop. The wheat crop takes off and grows after the rice. And he's, before he harvests the wheat, he puts seed balls out to grow a cover crop. And then he throws his rice out and floods the field and the rice grows. I read the book. <clears throat> Livestock integration will be needed. If, if you <clears throat> want to cycle nutrients, cows help. It gives you better nutrient cycles. It gives you more rotational flexibility, more crops you can grow. We need to work on automating that and making it multi-species. And we're working or hope to be working on these self-propelled grazing cells. But we have the technology now. You just have a cell out there. You call it up on your smartphone and go, how are my cows doing? Oh, looks like they're out of feed. Push a button and the thing would move. We could do that now. The technology is there. Somebody said, shit, this makes sense. We've automated them in feedlots, but we haven't automated them in the field. And there's way less disease pressure and stuff if we kept them in the field. It gives us a chance with these high prices we have for land to get young people back into the business. So, best biomass digester has four legs and goes moo. Right? And I like this one. We're soil testing and then they're going to apply the fertilizer, right? <laughs> so I, just, I couldn't resist that one. That was too good. Uh, but here's the Canadians do a lot of this. They swath the residue and whatever. And the reason they do is they have, they have had more BSE, mad cow. So if you have a cow over 24 months old, it's basically worthless in Canada. And for you guys that came to the conference in Huron several years ago, we had guys talking about doing this kind of thing. Perennial sequence or perennial cover crops will probably be necessary because annual crops don't go deep enough to bring the line back to the surface. Okay, in Australia, they have a huge problem with this. And that's where Colin Sizes thing works. But I was in a sorghum field one time where they thought it was drought problem with sorghum. But the only place the sorghum looked good was right around the tree. And then Ray Ward can tell us what that is. What nutrient deficiency symptom looks like drought problem? There you go. See how good he is? So when we tested, what the tree does is it brings the potassium up and puts it back at the surface. So in high rainfall areas, that's our cycler. In prairie areas, it's a deep-rooted grass because we don't get as much rainfall. And that's enough. You need a tree where it rains more. They get the rainfall in the wintertime. So what happened is we had 100 parts per million potassium around the tree, 5 parts per million where we're away from the tree. 
So the drouth wasn't a drouth, it was a potassium deficiency. I'll be damned. Nutrient cycling, rotational flexibility, building organic matter, we need to do all those things. We might, if we're going to do fuel, we might want to do biomass fuel. In our new building we're building, we're going to heat it with solar, wind, and biomass. Biomass only when we need to because we like to keep our organic matter and feed our cows. The, Austri <coughs> the Argentines used to have systems that were seven years of pasture and seven years of grazing. So here's cover crops, no cover crops, but this field would have been in seven years of pasture and then probably in about its fifth year of, of, <coughs> of crops. Look at the soil structure. That's 1997. And then the <coughs> Argentine government outlawed the export of beef. <coughs> and they said it was so the poor people could afford to, own beef, uh, to buy beef, because they eat twice as much beef per capita as we do. Great place to visit if you're a young single male guy, especially. Pretty girls, wine, and beef. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. <coughs> um, but <coughs> Ruth said, are they pretty? And I said, yeah. And, but I said, it's kind of like a dog chasing a car deer. I wouldn't know what to do with it if I caught it anyway. So, <laughs> But when they outlawed, the, the real reason for outlawing the export of beef is they wanted more soybeans because the way they collect taxes in, in Argentina is they take 32% of the soybeans that leave through the port, go to the government. So we have the IRS and all these rules and everything, right? Brick buildings, cars, computers, they got one guy, an auger, and a gun. <laughs> <coughs> but anyway, so everybody went to doing lots of soybeans. Because if you can't do cows, can't do the pastures, we're going to do soybean. And I finally in 2006, got to go back to the same field, because I'd been there a couple times and I was noticing I thought they were losing soil structure, but unless I went back to the same field, I couldn't tell you. That's the same field in 2006. That happened in 10 years. Soybeans on soybeans on soybeans, there's not enough carbon, there's not enough residue. Your carbon nitrogen ratio is all screwed up you're just going to totally destroy structure very fast. It's like doing tillage over and over and over again, and this is a platy, platy type structure. Here's one that we're doing right now. We have alfalfa. This is our long-term 23-year cornfield, but we've planted alfalfa in half of that, and we're keeping the alfalfa alive and the corn alive. And so far, so good, but we'll find out next spring. So the idea is kind of, Colin Sice is doing a warm season grass as a grazer, like a, looks like switchgrass or, or big blue stem, and then he grows canola and wheat during the winter time, during the dormant phase. Here during the dormant phase of the corn, the fall and the winter, we're going to have this perennial guy. Okay, we'll see if we can keep them both alive. Organic matter is the most important factor in determining the productivity of soil. Small amount of organic matter by weight has a big impact on pore space. Within an all texture groups, as we go from 1% to 3%, the available water capacity doubles. Go to 4% at 60%. <coughs> your water does not hold as much, your soil does not hold as much water as it did when grandpa got here. Because he's taken out the organic matter. So if you had a soil like on a, a <coughs> soil web that says, okay, it holds eight inches. Now it maybe holds six. What's that mean? A rainfall makes you saturated sooner. And then when you get a crop planted there, you get dry sooner. You have less resiliency. Your bucket is smaller. The best thing to do is get a bigger bucket. Okay? The other thing that happens is we might be changing carbon dioxide level in a canopy because if residues, these cover crops that deco de decompose after crop canopy is established, or the residue that decompose then can feed carbon dioxide to especially C3 plants. Cook and Vseth talked about that. Perhaps some of the improved water use efficiency results can be attributed to enhanced carbon dioxide concentration. 
So here's an example of ours you've seen before probably, but here's two rotations that look almost exactly the same, corn, pea, winter wheat. This one, though, has another soybean in there, so it's half broad leaves. <clears throat> this one up here is only a third broad leaf. Look at the difference in a dry year, 60 versus 29, with 7.9 inches of rain in, from July to July in 2006. In a good year, 92 versus 57, that's when we had 23 inches of rain. Here we had 6.4, 56 versus 28. That tells you the difference in resiliency. There's what it looked like. This is the low residue rotation there, high residue rotation there. That's what it looks like in an aerial photo. When you take off half of a 150 bushel acre corn crop, you're taking off 50 pounds an acre of N, 5 pounds of P, 100 pounds of K, and 3,000 pounds of carbon. <clears throat> I had a guy last week when I was traveling in Montana, somebody called me on the phone, wanted to buy my bales that we had spread out to do some bale grazing and stuff. I'm going, you can't, I, it took me like 20 minutes to convince him I didn't want to sell my damn residue. You can't have it. You know, like, well, I'll pay you good for it. You can't have it. Don't you want to know how much? No. You can't have it. A friend or a guy from South Dakota, no tilling. It's not about no till, it's about residue. Doesn't have any residue. Doesn't do any good to not do tillage because it's all sealed up, right, Ray? It's all screwed up there. There's no residue. It looks like Paul Yaz's organic thing. Where'd the residue go? Abdul took it. <laughs> and he took the roots along with it. Because in Muslim culture, if you leave anything out there, it belongs to the community. So you take it all and you put it on your semis <coughs> or your straight trucks and you, <laughs> and you take it to the building. But we laugh, but that guy, if <coughs> that's the residue he's going to feed to the goat that's going to give milk to his children. It's not because he's a greedy bastard that just wants a bigger four-wheel drive pickup. Okay? There wouldn't be anybody in this room that would do that. Take the E out of ET, take the T out of can't. <clears throat> Go to the South Dakota no-till.com and we've got like a good thing for doing rotations. There are different styles of rotations that you might have fun reading. Okay? Thank you.